Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Osir Sinoe Gonzalez Romero. I am very glad to be here. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, currently, I am a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Saskatchewan in the Department of History of Medicine. And I am glad to share with you some of the outputs of my research regarding uh, psychedelics. My focus, I have a background in philosophy and in Mesoamerican studies, and I'm trying to develop a philosophical approach trying to encourage and to explain the philosophical uses of psychedelics among uh, other uh, issues. Uh, to begin uh, with this uh, analysis, it is necessary to highlight the primary uses of psychedelics, which the scientific literature recognizes mainly. This is uh, really uh, important because we tend to overlap the different uses and, and the different meaning. And we use, for example, to state some criteria for from one uh, use uh, to another, and this causes some uh, misunderstandings. According to scientific uh, literature, for example, the uh, main uses of uh, psychedelics uh, have been therapeutic uses, ritual and religious uses, creative uses, hedonistic or adult uses, or recreative, another it's another form, but it, it's contested also. And this research clarified the scope of five philosophical uses. Mm -hmm. A philosophical approach considers that the psychedelic experience is a source of knowledge, not only a series of hallucinations. This is the first step to develop, uh, according to, 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 to my point of view, there are different philosophical approaches, but that the psychedelic experience is a source of knowledge is a source of wisdom, right? What kind of knowledge? Well, this workshop and the research, it's an attempt to analyze this matter. But it is possible to talk about knowledge of the brain, knowledge of the self, and knowledge of the interaction between human beings and nature and, and society, because nature is a philosophical context, a, a philosophical concept, and it is possible to analyze the rise of the concept of nature through the Western um, tradition. Let's move uh, forward. Quite cognitive liberty. Well, cognitive, cognitive liberty, it's a note date of the freedom of thought the classic uh, concept of freedom of thought, very, very well known um, within the liberal uh, tradition, right? But the challenge of the neurotechnologies of 21th century require an update of this uh, concept. The rise of neuroscience and the increase of technologies capable of affecting or monitoring cognition, such as functional magnetic resonance imaging, is one very well known images produced in the Imperial College of London, and so on. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, brain implants, brain machine interfaces, or the implementation of biochemistry and neuropsychopharmacology to enhance or modify the human cognition cause new philosophical dilemma. By this reason, it's necessary to develop an update from a philosophical perspective. The development of neuroscience requires an update of our conception of freedom of thought to face that transformation successfully. By the reason, it's important to address this uh, topic uh, nowadays because all these, neuro all these neurotechnologies represent challenge to the uh, cognitive liberty, to the freedom of thought. Of course, it is possible, for example, uh, to state according to the very well-known friends of liberalism, you know, the right to use, you know, and the absence of interference, you know, uh, developed by John Stuart Mill, uh, Isaiah Berlin, but also uh, Timothy Leary develops um, a version of, of this uh, topic 30 years before the concept of cognitive liberty was coined in, in a different approach. Uh, 
I can, I can, well, this is only an example. Okay, this is only an example of this, you know, technology that you know uh, better than me, right? The next uh, slide, please. Okay, this is the uh, one of the outputs of my research. Uh, the cognitive liberty and the psychedelic uh, humanities is one paper recently uh, published. And cognitive liberty is every person's fundamental right to think independently, use the full spectrum of his or her mind, and have autonomy over their brain chemistry. This is important because the politics of punishment, the politics of uh, prohibition, undermine this mental autonomy. Uh, 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 we, we can return. Uh, <laughs> no, no. The, yeah. The, this fundamental right implies some ethical issues, but the reason it's necessary to develop a philosophical approach, which are necessary to consider. For example, cognitive liberty concerns the ethics and legality of safeguarding one's own thought processes, and by necessity, one electrochemical brain states. The individual, not corporate and government interest, should have sole jurisdiction over the control and or modulation of his and her brain states and mental processes. This is the quote of one of the contemporary authors that address the issue of cognitive liberty, but there are several uh, approaches, five or six uh, different approaches, but mainly the, the approaches of course, are not um, developed from a psychedelic perspective. They consider cognitive liberty, but unfortunately, they don't take into account the psychedelic experience and their research. And okay, what does actually mean by the term cognitive liberty in the context of the psychedelic humanities? Uh, you know very well the, the, the work of Charlotte Walsh, uh, who argues. Cognitive liberty is in one sense synonymous with freedom of thought. Yet more precisely about the idea that this should be read to acknowledge the fact that individuals should have the right to autonomous self-determination over their right on brain chemistry, a right that is currently infringed by the prohibition of psychedelics. As you can appreciate, for example, in, in, in this approach, um, Charles, uh, uh, Charlotte Walsh uh, focus on individual rights. But perhaps another hypothesis could be try to consider collective rights. It's very common uh, to talk about psychedelic capitalism nowadays. I was in Denver, you know, it was a paradigmatic example of, of this. Of course, of course, uh, uh, there are different uh, approaches and different ways, but it's not very common, for example, to talk about psychedelic socialism. It's a strange, right? <laughs> or psychedelic anarchism, you know? And also uh, freedom and liberty are related with these political ideologies. And of course, it's necessary to, to, to take into account some nuances. For example, psychedelic anarchism will be useful to fill some gaps uh, left by psychedelic capitalism, right? The relevance of their research lies in analyzing a concept of liberty that is considered the foundation of ethics and politics. This section aims to display a brief overview of the constitutive elements of cognitive liberty. An analytical approach is crucial to a better understanding of their contemporary significance, mainly because, according to Peter, <laughs> uh, philosophy and psychedelics helps expand consciousness. And recognize this um, statement it's very useful, for example, to understand of the psychedelic experience outside of clinical settings. You know, the expanse of consciousness, of course, is useful to achieve a broad overview. As is possible to see, there is a contemporary approach regarding cognitive liberty and mental autonomy, which has been taken, taken up in psychedelic study during the first century by some scholars, such as Boire, Walsh, and Davis. These three authors addressed the issue of uh, cognitive uh, liberty, but from a psychedelic perspective, right? Okay, say self-contradictions. Uh, one, one, one important issue regarding uh, cognitive liberty and a reflection on, on, on liberty is to address the contradictions. You know, following Hegel, you know, 
uh, everything is full of, uh, of of contradictions and of call of and of course psychedelic capitalism is, is is full of them and from a philosophical perspective it's very fruitful to to start analyzing these contradictions right the set of contradictions and ambiguities embedding the concept of liberty mainly implemented as a domination tool this is one of the paradoxes of liberty um, most of times we tend to develop a naive approach of liberty an idealization of liberty and most of times we are not aware that the liberty and freedom are used as a mechanism of control especially for example in, in the states you know it is possible to talk about of an ideology of liberty right uh, mainly implemented as a domination tool have undermined its legitimacy due to the failures and injustice caused by neoliberal and technocratic regimes. For example, libertarianism, another interpretation of freedom, uh, reshaped the concept of liberal autonomy into consumer sovereignty, assuming that a free market society must prioritize medicalization, the interest of pharmaceutical companies, the opening of new market, the rise of psychedelic seals. Now in Canada, in Canada, it's a very well-known book called The Psychedelic Seal, right? And the wishes and expectation of consumers. One of the side effects of this degraded consumer's view of, of autonomy is the banalization or trivialization of the psychedelic experience, but also the paradoxical use of liberty as a mechanism of control. I, I, I want to... Uh, to make uh, an analogy with the state of uh, Hannah Arendt, when, when Hannah Arendt talk, talk about the trivialization of evil, you know, after the, the trials of Nuremberg, in the case of psychedelic studies, it's possible to talk about that trivialization of the psychedelic experience. As a philosopher, as a researcher, we have to be aware of the trivialization of the psychedelic experience. Of course, there is not a recipe, you know, to detect that, but it's interesting, for example, uh, within the rise of psychedelic capitalism, try to avoid the trivialization of psychedelic experience. Trivialization doesn't mean recognize ludic, creative, or hedonistic uses, because also hedonistic uses from a philosophical perspective are also stigmatized. You know, we are not reading Epicuro uh, um, um, very, very, very well. But on the other hand, trivialization, it's another social phenomenon. And one example of this trivialization, you can find it in some videos in YouTube with some American teenagers smoking salvia divinorum, right? Doing uh, crazy, crazy things. And due to this, salvia divinorum was not regulated. The authorities saw these, these videos and then start to regulate the substance. And on the other hand, for example, the legal psychedelic industry, the capitalists on, on drugs, in, in the previous slide, we saw, for example, uh, an image of Peter Thiel, uh, Elon Musk, and Mark Zuckerberg. And it's interesting the case of Peter Thiel because he is backing, you know, with a lot of money, the uh, psychedelic uh, research. But uh, Peter Thiel, a philosopher, German philosopher who studied at Stanford, he reshaped in a libertarian uh, way uh, to do it the concept of, of, of liberty. And it's a paradox because he claims for liberty, but he received support from the CIA for his company, right? Another contradiction, okay? To overcome some paradoxes and social contradiction attached to the psychedelic renaissance, it is necessary to reflect critically on liberty and update its meaning to the present needs. For instance, in the realm of psychedelic space, the significance of cognitive liberty related to consciousness. The right to control on consciousness is the quintessence of freedom. If freedom is to mean anything, it must mean that each person has an invaluable right to think for him or herself. It must mean at a minimum that each person is free to direct one's own consciousness, underlying mental processes, beliefs, opinions, and worldview, according to Boile, right? According to Foucault, the idea, the idea of control uh, could be contested, right? But this is another step. Let's move with Wiley. Okay, uh, let's move forward, Christine, please, with this, with the next. Okay, 
this is a, a more or less a, a reinforcement of the previous argument. And as I previously said, the connection between cognitive liberty and psychedelics could be summarized using the well-known frameworks of negative liberty developed by me, the absence of interference, and positive liberty coined by Isaiah Berlin. Regarding cognitive liberty, it's possible to talk about the right to refuse, absence of interference, or negative liberty, and the right to use the enhancement of cognition or positive liberty. There are two nuances regarding this topic. Let's move forward. The neuroenhancement is one of the critical traits advocated by psychedelic activism. A popular version of this topic was stated by Timothy Leary some decades before the term cognitive liberty was coined. The two commandments for the molecular age states. You shall not alter the consciousness of thy fellow man, as in the MK Ultra project, right? Uh, and you shall not prevent thy fellow man from altering his own consciousness. This is another version, or this is the popular psychedelic version of um, cognitive liberty, right? Uh, summarizing, cognitive liberty involves at least four philosophical meanings. Freedom of choice, freedom of religion, self-determination, and freedom of thought. These are the constitutive elements of cognitive liberty regarding psychedelic space. Each one has a specific implication in the field of uh, psychedelic studies, which is necessary to explain to avoid misunderstanding and hasty generalization. In the following, I will explain each one briefly to provide some uh, examples. Let's move uh, forward. For example, freedom of choice is related with dilemma. The dilemma is a philosophical, you know, a, a philosophical topic. <laughs> the right choice between A and B. This is a crucial aspect of freedom of, of choice. If you don't have freedom of choice, you know, uh, and of course it's important to address from a philosophical perspective, it's a dilemma. And in our daily life, we face multiple dilemmas and the dilemmas are full of, you know, uh, subjective, uh, emotional and social uh, issues embedded on it. Freedom of choice goes beyond the therapeutic uses of psychedelics. Also, it involves the development of human faculty, the enhancement of cognitive skills, the achievement of psychological insights, and gender issues. For example, choosing one's gender or identity. It's very important because also, as you will know, uh, as, as you know, for example, it's a rise movement of uh, queering psychedelics, which requires, for example, special or different frameworks than usual. Let's move forward. Um, this is a really interesting uh, quote from uh, Sasha Shuri, right? Regarding uh, autonomy and freedom of choices. And I, I like this quote because it's, it's really um, profound. From the scheme inward is my jurisdiction. Is it not? I choose what may or may not cross that border. Here, I am the custom agent. I am the cost board. The Coast Guard. I am the sole legal and spiritual government of this territory, and only the laws I choose to enact within myself are applicable. What I think, when I focus my awareness, what biochemical reaction I choose to cause within the territorial, territorial boundaries of my own schemes are not, are not subject to the beliefs, morals, laws, or preference of any other person. I am a sovereign state. And I feel that my borders are more sacred than the politically drawn boundaries of any country. Of course, we can address critically this analogy between the self boundaries and the boundaries of a country, right? But I guess that uh, Sasha Shulkin is a perfect example of this uh, freedom of choice, of this mental autonomy. This is one example. Let's move. Uh, freedom of religion this is another example. This is um, a photo uh, took by the book of uh, Joseph Calabrese based in uh, London, you know, and he developed a, a, a really good work on uh, cross-cultural healing with the Navajo people in the States and the rise of the Native American church. Of course, also the, the role of the, American, uh, the Native American church is uh, controversial, for example, due to the over-harvesting of uh, peyote, for example, the vast majority of peyote comes from Mexico. 
not the, the, the peyote that grows in the south of Texas, it's not enough to supply the needs of the, Ameri of the Native American church with at least 600,000 you know, members, right? Ritual and spiritual uses of psychedelics are at the core of the so-called psychedelic renaissance, mainly in areas such as anthropology and the history of religions. Both disciplines have contributed to a better understanding of ritual uses in ancient cultures, the, spiritual of, the spirituality of indigenous peoples, and new age reinterpretation. In the States, freedom of religion is one of the critical features of the so-called psychedelic research revival, mainly due to the, the implementation in the USA of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. This amendment has been very influential because it allows some exemption from the general rule and mainly because it represents a chink in the armor of provision policies. A very well-known example in the USA are the Native American churches, some ayahuasca churches such as Union do Vegetal, sorry for my bad Portuguese, Santo Daime Church and the Rastafari religions. There are some examples, of course, each one requires uh, an analysis, a special analysis to understand better the cultural framework of these movements. But on the other hand, uh, it's not very common to talk about athletes within the psychedelic uh, sphere. And it's interesting because uh, um, a bunch of uh, research in the psychedelic uh, space take into account um, you know, uh, uh, mysticism, history of religion, and so on. But in a broad sense, freedom, freedom of religion not, you know, and it's necessary to take into account. Why I say this? Because I found, for example, some uh, news in the press that say, oh, after a session of psilocybin mushrooms, I have been cured for my atheism. <laughs> right? Consider atheism, you know, as a sickness, as 30 years ago, for example, the conversion therapists were considered a mental health issue. Unfortunately, this is not very common, but nowadays, especially in some American settings, they consider atheism, you know, as a sickness, and we have to be aware of it. This is an interesting uh, article for the debate, for, for the uh, reflection. Chris Leitevi and Wayne Blouser address this topic and, and watch. Um, I don't have, uh, we don't have uh, too much time, but I'd only highlight that it was necessary to address properly the issue of psychedelic attains, for example, in clinical trials, the certain setting, and so on. Let's move forward, Christine. Self-determination, of course, self-determination is related with the rights of uh, indigenous peoples, not only, but mainly. Liberty had, has had its foundations since ancient Greek philosophy through the concept of through the concept of eleutheria, translated as freedom. However, a careful analysis shed light on other constitutive elements such as terms include autonomia and autarkeia, self-sufficiency, but also parousia, freedom of speech, which designated above all relations yes. between freedom and self-preservation and self-determination. Analyzing the link between self-determination and autonomy within the context of psychedelic assisted therapy requires further explanation. And regarding, for example, the rights of indigenous people, it will be useful to address self-determination with the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, especially regarding uh, indigenous knowledge. Now, uh, take into account, for example, the different worldviews, the different uh, indigenous philosophy, and the right to self-determination. Uh, this is very important to develop public policies, especially in um, multicultural uh, countries. Uh, okay, freedom of thought, it's the, uh, another um, uh, constitutive element of uh, cognitive liberty. And this is possible to talk about the philosophical uses of liberty. Here we have a very nice picture of Plato you know, with the colors and, and, and so on. And as I previously mentioned, the philosophical uh, uses of psychedelics highlights that the psychedelic experience is a source, source of knowledge and not only a series of hallucinations. It's not the only uh, approach, but I am trying to develop it. Uh, okay, what does it mean to talk about philosophical uses of psychedelics? 
Here it is necessary to point out that in psychedelic research, the legitimate uses are mainly religious or therapeutic. However, this categorization is a false dichotomy because these legitimate uses are tied mainly to churches, hospitals, and pharmaceutical companies, especially, for example, regarding the psilocybin debate between Alex Boehner, you know, and some psychiatrists. You know, uh, it's interesting from a philosophical perspective to move forward and to avoid the false dilemma between uh, hospitals and churches, it's necessary to take into account a different approach. This is really important to recognize the different uses because we tend to overlap the uses. If we don't make a clear dis distinction of the uses, we will continue overlapping uh, you know, these, uh, these meanings. And, and for example, uh, if you have a, a uh, diagnosis, of course, you need a psychologist, a therapist, or psychiatrist. But if you don't have a diagnosis, for example, perhaps you don't need. Not everybody needs a shaman, for example. And not everybody needs a psychiatrist. Right? By this reason, it's necessary to recognize the different uses because we tend to overlap. You know, and we tend to do hasty generalization regarding these different uses. For example, nowadays, the medicalization of the psychedelic renaissance, of course, it's focused on, um, for example, uh, alternatives to uh, resident depression. Resident depression will become the third cause of disability in the world. More or less 700, uh, uh, 700 millions of people will face uh, the uh, resistant depression in the following years, more or less 10% of the world's population. It's, it's not a minor issue. But of course, we have the rest 90% of the population. And this medicalization, for example, doesn't take into account the 90% the the, the of, the, of the population. But the reason it, it's, it's interesting, you know that the following week in the British Museum, will take place a gathering of, of psych. You know, this very well-known uh, report that psychedelics as, as medicines. And for example, analyzing this and the opening of the market of uh, psychedelics for, for the following years, I was made an analysis of these calculus. And according to the psychic reports, for example, Europe spends every year uh, 40 billion of euros in mental health issues. UK spent 90 billion uh, of, of British pounds in mental health issues, and the United States spent two, uh, 240 billion US dollars in mental health issues. I don't know if these numbers are true or not, but at least there are a, a reference. And the size of the psychedelic market, for example, for the, for the following five years will be 8 billion. You know, as, as I can appreciate, for example, the, um, the, the, the money spent, it's a huge amount of money. And I consider that the goal to become a psychedelic into mainstream is to save money in mental health issues. And of course, open the market and, and so on, but mainly save money. Since, since the times of Humphrey Osmond in, in Saskatchewan during the therapies with LSD and so, and so on, he received the authorization because um, his proposal uh, was uh, able to save time and money, you know? And these are the, the main criteria for the medicalization and psychedelic uh, capitalism. Philosophy of psychedelics, this is one of, of the works, you know, developed, work of Peter, Chris Letterby, also in Spanish. Antonio Escotado is not very well known, but he did a, a really, really wonderful job, phenomenology of, of the drugs. And of course, this is the philosophy and uh, psychedelics. You know, I had the privilege to contribute with the chapter five, the colonizing the philosophy of psychedelics. It's part of one of the outputs of my uh, postdoc. And also the previous uh, article, this uh, book chapter, you know, and, and in this article, I try to develop a colonial approach of the subject. This is another uh, output of, of, of my research. This is a collaborative um, paper written with indigenous scholars from Canada. 
trying to address the role of uh, indigenous uh, philosophies. For example, the ontological term has revealed both overlaps and incompatibilities, incompatibilities between indigenous knowledge and Western scientific knowledge. For example, many biological identity categories are similar between indigenous and Western knowledge systems. However, some biological identity categories are incompatible. And this is interesting to address this issue, the issue of incommensurability, right? It's necessary to take into account. It's very uh, common to know or to recognize the role of incommensurability in theory of science, for example, in the philosophy of Thomas Kuhn and Paul Foyer Pairad and, and so on. But it's necessary also to, to address in the field of uh, philosophy of culture, the theory of culture, especially regarding indigenous philosophies in plural, because we have to recognize the difficult to, um, I don't want to use the word translate, but to move some categories or concepts from uh, uh, different worldviews based on, on, or grounded in different epistemologies, right? And we have to recognize that some of these categories or concepts are not translatable. We have to recognize the incommensurability. On the other hand, well, of course, it's possible to, to bridge or to develop bridges of understanding, recognizing that, there are, that they are heuristic tools. They are hypotheses. For example, uh, concepts uh, like um, uh, animism, you know, uh, are bridges of understanding trying to address this issue, uh, trying to achieve an, an understanding for for both sides, but there are not the only ones, okay? The second part of the, of the talk, it's focused on uh, epistemic uh, injustice, because it's also one of the paradoxes embedded in the psychedelic renaissance. For example, cultural colonization prevails inside a wider rate of universities, academic institutions, and research centers worldwide. By the reason, it's very important to celebrate this space of freedom of thought, you know, uh, and space to talk about psychedelics, uh, indigenous knowledge, develop a critical approach of uh, medicalization, and to analyze, of course, the therapeutic alternatives. It is manifested by the lack of recognition of philosophical diversity in study programs. For example, the philosophy of psychedelics, indigenous philosophies, or feminist philosophies play a marginal role, unfortunately. For this reason, it is crucial to recognize this legacy of how cultural organization serve power structures, patriarchy, social injustice, and discrimination. The aim of this talk is toward developing a colonial analysis of some epistemic values existing in major philosophy, mainly internal colonialism. The first step is to recognize the philosophical uses of psychology. Okay, decolonization. Decolonization is a growth, you know, movement, and it's necessary to highlight what we are understanding by decolonization. According to the proposal of Franz Fanon, it's not the only one, but of course, it's a classic and it's very useful for psychedelic studies because he was um, a military man, but also a psychiatrist. And the uh, approach of Fanon, for example, it's really useful to address properly the effects, the, the the effects of colonialism in mental health, right? Not only regarding to psychedelics, but how colonialism shape, you know, mental health. This is internal colonialism. This is a really uh, very brief, you know, uh, scheme of how uh, internal colonialism uh, works. And according to King Yang, for example, internal colonialism is related with biopolitical you know, and if your political management of people, land, flora, fauna, you know, all, all the psychedelics within the domestic borders of the imperial nation. This involves the use of particularized modes of control, prison, ghettos, minoritizing, schooling policies. All these cultural features are present, you know, in the politics of prohibition regarding not only psychedelics, but drugs in general. Internal colonialism, for example, in Mexico, According to Pablo Gonzalez Casanova, a sociologist who became commander of the uh, Zapatista army, the rights of its inhabitants and their economic, political, social, and cultural situation are regulated and imposed by the central government. In general, the colonizers within a national state belong to a race. 
other than the one that dominates the national government, which is considered inferior or that must is turned into a liberating symbol that is part of the state the model. The majority of the colonized belong to a different culture and speak a different language from the national one. By this reason, for example, it's necessary to take into account indigenous language in order to avoid, for example, the projection of Western uh, patterns, um, for example, regarding uh, shamanism. You know, if you are doing uh, work in, a, in an indigenous community and if you know the language, if you arrive to the community and ask, who is the shaman, they say, no, perhaps this is not the world. For example, in Maya, it's the Aki, in Nahuatl, the Tlamatinime, in, in a new people, it's the Badi. And of course, all of these words have different meanings. For example, Maracame, it's the which all uh, shaman. The translation is the singer. Right? In the case of Nahuatl, it's the one who knows, the wise woman or, or wise man. And each indigenous language has very important nuances that it's necessary to take into account to achieve a better understanding of the cognitive structure of indigenous knowledge. Indigenous philosophies, for example, uh, according to Gregory Cajete, Gregory Cajete is a Tewa scholar who wrote two interesting uh, works. The first one is called Native Science, and the second one is Philosophy of Native Science, right? The quote is from the, from the second one. There is then a visionary tradition involved with this understanding that encompasses harmony, compassion, hunting, growing, technology, spirit, things, dance, color, number, cycle, balance, death, and renewal. The mind and body can be used for careful, disciplined, and repeatable observation. Knowledge is gathered through the body, mind, and heart in altered states of being. I want to highlight this. In altered states of being, in songs, and dance, in meditation and reflection, and in dreams and visions. Here we have a broader approach of knowledge to take into account altered states, not altered states of consciousness, altered states of being, which is, you know, a, a, a cultural noise regarding this topic. And of course, this is a wonderful. Uh, image from the uh, Viralica people. It has, you know, a, a meaning. This is the Nierica. And the Nierica, for example, it's a, it's a door between different worlds, right? It's a kind of the eye of God, right? We don't have time to explain this with detail, right? But later, perhaps. <laughs> On the ontological term, of course, it's, it's contested. But regarding, for example, these um, fungi uh, stones from Guatemala, from the Maya culture, the archaeological evidence, for example, indicate that psychedelic plants and fungi uh, have been used for at least uh, 3,000 years in Mesoamerica. The main uses, again, cultural uses recorded for indigenous people are sacred root or ritual, therapeutic uses, and three divinatory uses. You know, nowadays divinatory uses are, uh, you know, old fashioned. You no, know? but we have to take into account it's another cultural uses. The process of personification of sacred entities is one of the central features of the ontology of indigenous peoples used in philosophical vocabulary. Thus, it is necessary to take an ontological turn to better understand the sacred and ritual uses of scientific mushrooms. This implies recognizing that there are different ways of relating human beings and nature, other than the paradigm that prevails in Western culture. And four, recognizing this ontological pluralism is the first step towards a better understanding of the cultural usage mentioned above. Based on the ontology of the indigenous people, mormons are not be considered a drug or, or a psychoactive system, but rather as sacred beings or entities with which with which reciprocal relationships are established. But also ontological pluralism is not only a scholarly matter, it's related with legal pluralism. If we, if, we, if we want to address properly legal pluralism, first of all, it's necessary to make a philosophical step, recognize the ontological pluralism, 
because legal pluralism it's a it's a really important issue in a multicultural state. For example, a cross-cultural democracy is needed in the States, in Canada, in Mexico, in Europe, a cross-cultural psychiatry, a cross-cultural psychedelic assisted <laughs> therapy is required, it's not easy. But how to develop a cross-cultural democracy? How to develop a cross-cultural uh, psychedelic assisted therapy if we don't know, if we don't understand properly, you know, the indigenous philosophy? Right? Five, in the worldview of indigenous peoples, the native peoples, the earth, the earth, the mountains, the clothes, and of course the sacred mushrooms are entities endowed with, with life. A personality is attributed to them, and it is possible to establish communication through sacred and ritual language. For example, a peyote and mushroom are not isolated from the territory. From a Western perspective, we tend to isolate it, right? We tend to focus on the substance. And in, in, in um, indigenous worldview, it's a different approach, and they are not isolated from the sacred landscape from the territory, even nowadays in the psychedelic renaissance, we are focused on psilocybin. There is not a single study worldwide focused on natural mushrooms, on organic mushrooms. Yeah? Nowadays, I am collaborating in a project in Mexico, Project Teonanacatl, a dialogue of, of, of knowledge. And they are performed, for example, the first chemical analysis of psilocybin cubensis, not a, an indigenous uh, use of this uh, space in, in Mexico, but, but the, the, the student that is working on this issue spends almost one year, you know, in the analysis, and they don't finish yet. And it is necessary, for example, to know the entourage effect, you know, not only the psilocybin, but, then, but also another substances present in, in, in the funding. This is a really interesting how in, in the Western culture we tend to isolate, you know, the different components of the, the psychedelic. Yeah, this is the book of Gregory Cacete, Native Science, you know, written by an indigenous scholars. Nowadays, for example, the government of Canada recognizes a ministry of uh, indigenous science. You know? It will be controversial. Perhaps some people will, will agree or will disagree that the concept of science you know, fits or not with indigenous uh, indigenous uh, knowledge, it's an open question. I don't have an answer to this. We have to address if this proposal is right or it has some implication. Well, uh, only only to the, 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 the previous one, yeah, only only to highlight this. Uh, the, another topic, animism, according to Gregory Cajete. I want to highlight this quote, for example. According to Cajete, the word animism perpetuates a modern produce, a disdain and a projection of inferiority toward the worldview of indigenous people. But if, as the French phenomenologist Merleau-Ponty contends, perception as its most elemental expression in the human body is based in our participation with our surroundings, then it can be said that animism is the basic human trait common to both indigenous and modern sensibilities. This is a statement. As a philosopher, you know, we can to discuss, right? Uh, Maria Sabina, you know, we are approaching to the end of this part of the conference. Wise woman, the work of woman is frequently overlooked also in the psychedelic uh, sphere, in the, in the psychedelic space, mostly the knowledge of indigenous woman and mostly, for example, Maria Sabina was a, a, a wise woman, but for example, she was illiterate. Also, for example, uh, she was not able to speak Spanish. And we, uh, and of course, our understanding of her thoughts, it's mediated by translations, reinterpretations, has to realization and commodification, right? It's a kind of unknown world, yeah, right? Now, colonialism, for example, in 1957, it, it's another approach. Life Magazine published one of the most impactful articles in modern history about psychedelics. Seeking the Magic Mushroom was written by a foreman, G.P. Morgan Banker. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the point. How to address the relationship between a G.P. Morgan Banker 
and an indigenous woman. Of course, uh, we have to address uh, this issue according to the um, framework developed by Foucault of power relations, how the power relations are working. Of course, it's important not to idealize uh, Maria Sabina and condemn uh, Robert Gordon Watson, but it's impossible to take into account the imbalance of power. For example, um, Robert Gordon Watson arrived by train to the village, right? You know, because there was no way to do it, you know, by 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 by, by bus or, or or by car. But can you imagine 500, uh, um, uh, 50 years ago, arriving to the village in a plane, you know, to perform some research? This imbalance of power, it's necessary to take, in, to take into account. But moreover, uh, he made a promise to don't develop the identity of Maria Sabina. However, two years of the uh, within two years of the story publishing, psilocin, psilocin and psilocybin, the main active components in the mushrooms, were isolated, characterized, synthesized, and named by Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman at the Sandus Pharmaceutical Company. And Sandus quickly patented extraction procedure and a method for therapeutic tranquilization, marketing pills under the trade name Indocibi. Of course, uh, Albert Hoffman is a uh, uh, very well-known scientist with a wonderful work, but also uh, conscious or unconscious, he was part of this um, uh, extractive, extractivism process. For example, the name of Indocibi. Yeah, Indocibi. Uh, it's a, a treatment for uh, therapeutic tranquilization, and it's necessary to address critically this, this issue. Not to deny uh, science, but also to recognize that science is, is not an innocent, you know, activity as Donna Haraway states, the Yeah, you have 17 more slides. You are over time. Okay. You find Thank a you. way in your powerful position as speaker. <laughs> I'm blaming myself powerful person pressing the button. No, please don't. <laughs> I'm actually asking you maybe right to the woman. A couple of slides and then I will, I will show it. <laughs> but this is the colonialism. Let's move on with an example. Um, well, th this one. It, it's, it, there, there are no other slides, that's only examples. Of. From an indigenous perspective, according to the to the work of Gerber et al., of course, we have to discuss this. Uh, Silotical research and drug development in order to, to move forward with the Christian presentation. Tells a story of extraction, cultural appropriation, bioprospecting, and colonization in life. Magazine article Robert Gordon Wilson wrote of his expedition to Oaxaca and uh, wrote of his expeditions. He initially protected with the pseudonym Eva Mendes. Eva Mendes was the nickname of Maria Sabina. But however, Wilson ultimately betrayed his promise and revealed his teacher's identity, Curandera, or Wise Woman. And his second volume, uh, Muslim, in, in his second volume, Muslim, Russia and History. He also widely published and publicized her photographs, thus constituting portrait betrayal. After Wilson visit to Walter de Jimenez, conflict ensued. Maria Sabina was bri briefly jailed and her house was set on fire. Of course, the department of Robert Gordon Wilson in Manhattan was really safe. You know, after the encounter, but in the case of Maria Sabina, the house was set on fire. Imbalances of power, right? And to, to close this, only to, to highlight uh, to highlight some um, uh, works. You know, with, with the next with the next slide. If you are interested, for example, these uh, these works move, move forward, Christine, please. For example, um, ethical ethical concerns. And ethical principles. I recommend these two readings because both both are written by indigenous scholars, right? All of them are indigenous scholars. Yeah. The massive perspective of globalization of psilocybin, you know, uh, research carried out by indigenous scholars would have to take into account. And that's it. This is another example of colonialism, the, the case of the radical people within the Biricuta Desert. This sacred land, for example was sold to Majestic Silver Company in Vancouver. All the territory in which the uh, peyote grows 
uh, it's under a mining concession, right? This is the, the map, you know? This is the region in which the coyote grows in the state. This is not enough to supply, for example, the, all the needs of the Native American church. You know, all the peyote comes from this region in, in Mexico. Right? Some um, issues regarding psychedelic feminism. I am not a specialist. Perhaps some, some people it's more um, qualified to, to address properly. And the role of uh, women and psychedelics related to colonialism. And then uh, to, to close, you know, the concept of psychedelic justice in order to make a counterweight of the epistemic injustice. Uh, this, I recommend this, this book to, to achieve a plural overview of this topic. Conclusions, right? Uh, no conclusions? Yeah. No, no. Uh, the, the last, the last. Okay. The colonizing the philosophy of psychedelics implies the issuing of new questions and avenues of research to replace the internal colonialism which prevailed in mindful philosophy by another type of philosophy based on cognitive liberty and one capable of opening our talk to a different of mental landscapes. Uh, to move, uh, okay, to move beyond the false dichotomy between hospitals and churches, freedom of choice. It is necessary to critically address the philosophical uses of psychedelic experience. And thank you very much for your time. Because we have some questions now, let's make it 10. Yeah. Sure. So I was thinking that you have like the uh, well, the way I thought about this is probably you are inviting us to have a look at the philosopher instead of a psychiatrist uh, or a shampoo in us right at the beginning. And I like the idea. But there are a couple of things like sovereignty that I think are problematic in itself. As well. I'm thinking we've added the freedom, uh, even self determination huh? is one of those things that is not a neutral term, right? So, yeah. so these, these notions of sovereignty, can you expand on that and the implications of alterity? Um, and what what does that not freedom, especially in an American way, that freedom is exactly the opposite of sovereignty? Yeah, the, the sovereignty is a contested issue. It's a controversial issue. For example, according to, to the hypothesis of um, Oliver Davis from the Warwick, uh, Warwick Uni University, for example, he, he wrote a paper on the autonomy and the psychedelic assisted uh, therapy. And, and, and of course, uh, the notion of uh, sovereignty, um, it's, it's controversial or, or it's, it contested, for example, um, and the right of self-determination regarding international relations, right? But it's necessary to reshape in the psychedelic space, for example, mental sovereignty, you know, or mental autonomy. It's necessary, for example, to build and a specific framework, you know, because um, in the political uh, in the political spheres, it is possible to appreciate a lot of contradictions, right? And you know, mental mental sovereignty or, or, or sovereignty is related first of all with country, but how about individual sovereignty? It is possible or not? No, because we are we are embedded in a set of power relations. No? which are the borders of this uh, sovereignty, right? So, uh, um, moreover, the self-determination rights, um, it could be understand um, uh, as a way of um, separatism, you know, in, in, in most countries. For example, this is the fear in Mexico, but also in Spain, you know, the self-determination of the uh, autonomic regions, right? It implies a lot, of, a, a lot of problems. In the case of psychedelic assisted therapy, it has two, two ways, you know, regarding the individual, but also regarding indigenous peoples. And mostly, for example, the self-determination is focused on the right of indigenous peoples to, um, to determine their own ways of living. And according, for example, to the to the final slides, 
it is necessary, for example, to take into account the works of indigenous scholars and community assemblies to move forward, for example, with this research. You know? And is this sovereignty itself a colonial legacy? Right, that political notion itself, I would say, is linked with this colonialism of political philosophy over other indigenous ways of governance. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I, I uh, there's there's something that so it's thinking from rather from the side of Canadian, right? Because yeah. it's completely post sovereignty, and then from the side of the colonial issue, sovereignty is also the imposition of the Eurocentric political imagination on the institution themselves. So do we really need sovereignty there? It, it's freedom as a tool of domination, right? It's one of the aspects, you know? If you are talking about freedom, you have to take into account, you know, the different nuances. And of course it's good to, um, to analyze and to criticize these, these notions, right? But uh, according to this framework, it's necessary, you know, to deal with, you know, from different approaches of the critical one, but also, for example, it, it opens another base of research. You know, it's like, it's kind of the uh, great concept of aletheia, you know, that you, you uh, reveal something, but at the same time you are hidden. You know, the, the, the reality is a paradox, it's one of the paradox. You know, it, it will be possible, for example, to develop a research on the paradoxes of liberty or the paradoxes of freedom, right? How freedom or liberty are used as a domination tools. It's the, the thing that you are saying. Yeah, but you are right in that sense. Helene, please. Um, so you mentioned that the okay, is that a actually. Um, and I keep, I keep thinking, so um, I think what I was going to say is similar to the point that Vanessa just picked up. So this idea of knowledge Mm -hmm. I also think that it has become a notion that carries many Western and colonial approaches to understanding. And um, so I, I wonder if, uh, you know, for the purposes of religion, let's say, we, we might want better of thinking about wisdom and experience rather than knowledge and understanding, for example, when it comes to psychedelic experiences and indigenous wisdom and uh, in general rather than because i think knowledge brings with it this idea of systematic kind of understanding there's some sort of structure of uh, uh of, of thought that might that i think is quite western and so maybe yeah. Yeah, to me at least the idea of wisdom is closer to uh what we're trying to do and it, it also makes better it's more connected to life, and it seems to me that whenever we talk about indigenous um, knowledge, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is what we are referring to. So this connectedness, awareness of life around uh, the earth, around us, etc. So I think wisdom would be a better notion, and it also links better to the idea of expansion of consciousness, because I'm struggling to see the link between expansion of consciousness and knowledge which can be very, you know, structured and kind of put in a box and say knowledge about something, uh, knowledge of something, where the expansion of consciousness, at least to me, uh, I'm not clear what it means in terms of knowledge. So okay. what do you think? Good, good questions um, um, regarding, for example, knowledge. Um, I want to highlight the fact, for example, that by the reason it's important to know indigenous languages. You know, because knowledge is one of these, you know, uh, categories or these heuristic tools, at least in Nahuatl language, which is the indigenous language that I know. For example, the verb mati, it's at, it, it's at the same time to, to wise and to feel, not isolated, to know and to feel. And in Nahuatl language, there is a difference between wisdom and knowledge, right? The, the word for um, oh, I know, I, I, the old the old fashion <laughs> and the, the word for, for uh, wisdom in Nahuatl is tlamatilistli, and the word for knowledge is tlaixmatilistli. The prefix x uh, refers to the eyes and to the face. You know, the difference, for example, between 
wisdom and knowledge in Nahuatl language is that the in the process of knowledge, the, the eyes and the brain are involved. And you can find, for example, the word in different manuscripts from 16th century. For example, in the Florentine Codex, when they refer to the physician, they refer as the one who knows uh, the plants, the one who knows the trees, the one who knows the roots with the word uh, knowledge, right? And of course, uh, knowledge or science, it's more contested, for example, native science, according to the proposal of, of Gregory Cajete, right? But regarding knowledge, it will be useful, for example, to address the specific indigenous languages. At least in Nahuatl, there is a difference, you know, between, between wisdom and knowledge. And knowledge is a, it, it's part of the cognitive structures of, of Nahuatl people. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. It's really interesting. And I especially like how you're sort of moving away from the easy critique of the prohibitionist framework to the more interesting critique of the sort of psychedelic capitalism framework, right? Yeah. And I think that the, the sort of the indigenous perspective has a lot to offer us here. Um, but I think that, well, first of all, I think that we could say a little bit more maybe about some of the problems with how, and I, I don't want to sort of, again, you know, homogenize indigenous pieces of psychedelics, but they're often very right, and, and, you know, we have, but I mean, there is oftentimes this kind of master-disciple relationship that's associated with psychedelic initiation in indigenous cultures. Uh, and then this leads to my question. I would like to kind of provoke you a little bit on that point, but I also want to bring in, in the fourth possible framework, which would be the kind of the welfare state's idea of consumer protection, yeah. right, which has a, a, a whole separate set of ideas about freedom in terms of you know, freedom of choice, freedom to make, you know, sort of informed decisions, basis of good advertising, right, you know, sort of making sure qualified professionals are involved at all levels, and that there's some sort of, you know, so I'm, I'm curious, sort of, how you would, you would sort of take criticisms of the indigenous uh, paradigm to the degree we can talk about such a thing, and also whether you have thoughts about the kind of a more welfare state kind of regulatory approach to psychedelics that you might also bring in, that isn't prohibitionist, but isn't laissez fair. Yeah. But the reason it's necessary to develop a cross-cultural approach, for example, in the case of Nahua people, for example, the way to initiate the shaman, it's through a thunderbolt. <laughs> if you survive to a process of a thunderbolt, you know, you are able to heal. It's not an easy, you know, it, 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 it's not only a game, yeah. right? For example, in the Popocatépetl uh, region, the, the Tiempero, the Granicero, it's the one to survive the heat of the thunderbolt. And this is a special, this is a special person, right? Yeah. Although it becomes the hereditary afterwards. So if your granddad was the one who killed by the thunderbolt, then your kids become the as well. You can have that in the Yeah. Which is kind of like something yeah. there. there you know. and, and, and the transference of knowledge among generations, right? On the other hand, you have the regulatory framework of the welfare, uh, of the welfare state. But also, for example, in the welfare state or in the Western state, you have some uh, political issues regarding indigenous autonomy uh, or sober, sovereignty uh, uh, or, or, or indigenous autonomy. And the challenge is how to, um, how to take into account or to consider these different uh, liberties, how to recognize properly the right of self-determination of indigenous people, even, for example, the right to refuse, the right to say, no, I don't want that the research will be carrying on on, on on this topic. And on the other hand, recognize, for example, that we tend to idealize, we tend to idealize freedom. We tend to idealize liberty and very few of us consider freedom as a tool of domination, you know? Only to close, for example, this, I just start uh, to thinking about freedom as a domination tool. 20 years ago, more or less, when the 11 of September, you know, terrorist attacks and so on, I was, uh, of course, there were not mobile phones and so on. I was uh, moving to my English lesson very close in the morning. And okay, the attacks and so on. And, and, and the next image that I saw, it's uh, George Bush in, in, in a, you know, in this huge uh, ship surrounded by militaries, 
you know, the Marines and so on. And he stayed, uh, he discourse, freedom was attacked. Okay. Freedom was attacked. You assume that the states are the freedom and the freedom was attacked. And now, and today, now we are, we'll be bombing this country and, and from, uh, you know, freedom was attacked. And then my response is, you know, to make the war. This is a paradox, you know, uh, it doesn't care if you are, you know, supporting the welfare state. This is the paradox of, of freedom, right? So I, I would like to know, we have time for this. Well, yeah. I don't speak fast. Okay, no. what is the positionality in terms of uh, native science? I find I find the whole term kind of like the, a perfect example of coloniality, right? So this idea that indigenous people have to look like science and lots of the things that come from the colonial literature is why the hell do we need native science? Why is it compared to these scientific space? And you brought that up. So I just wanted to know what is your position there? Well, it's the same case of religion or philosophy. Mm -hmm. They have an heuristic tools, you know, in the anthropology, for example, in, in the anthropology research, no, nobody, you know, questions religion. We assume religion as a universal fact, yeah, a universal character. No? And of course, you, you have to address the both sides, you know. For example, your position is one way, you know. On the other hand, for example, if we don't recognize indigenous philosophies, right, or, or indigenous science or indigenous knowledge, Remember that they are heuristic tools and we have an incommensurability and all these categories are uh, bridges of understanding. It's not an easy uh, topic. It's not an easy issue. And of course, a dogmatic perspective, for example, it's not the best way to do it. Of course, it's a philosophical you know, proposal and we have, uh, uh, we have the right to criticize the proposal of uh, Gregory Cajete. You know, I only put on the debate table, but it's the same, for, for example, shamanism. Mm -hmm. you no? Know? Science, shamanism, religion, philosophy, of course, all of them are Western concepts. But it's an attempt to deal, you know, with this incommensurability. You know, I don't have, you know, and anyone has. They are individual answer for this, you know, it will be a collective work of reflection to address this issue properly. And the paradoxes, by the reason I mentioned, you know, this Hegelian view of the paradoxes, our, our starting point is contradictions from a philosophical approach, of course, if you are developing, you know, a clinical trial or, or so on, you have to be careful with other issues, right? But from a philosophical perspective, there are a lot of contradictions and then in, in, this, in this field, right? Thank you. So give all further questions towards the end. The, let's see whether I can answer. I can't. For now, I can't. But I've now changed the way that we set up. It might be much easier. So, okay. Um, Do so we thought we would divide this up. This workshop on ethics in the psychedelic space, and we speak each about what we know better. Osiris and I have been working together with numerous other colleagues in Exeter and worldwide in a sort of decolonizing discussion group, which means hybrid every few weeks. Um, with that, we have produced one paper together, and now we are starting a new one. Um, so, but my expertise is far more on the clinical trials. And so I will now look at sort of some ethical aspects that I will point out, issues how these models of power and how power is enacted within the clinical setting in psychedelics. So I will speak first about what actually the image I've made and then go into the clinical trial scientific method. Then I will talk about emulation disconnection. I will go a little bit into the discussion about using planes as a technology of sort of controlling clinical trials and how this is presented within the science because it is so interestingly unashamedly guiding and controlling the experience people have, which may in the clinical case of people with a diagnosis be necessary to achieve the aims of the therapeutic outcome. 
But the main point to this, which I will come back in the end, is that if we actually allow this to be the route to access psychedelic experiences, we don't have any philosophically or otherwise relevant psychedelic experiences at all, because the therapeutic purpose is very peculiar, and this is the point I'm going to try to make here. Okay, and then I brush that out of it. So there are sort of three different nice images in it. So I will talk mainly about clinical trials and a little bit about the utilization and utilitarian uses of psychedelics that rest in this. And I will not talk much about these other two aspects that came up in Cyrus's talk and which uh, we have to discuss more at a, in a different time. But these, of course, are really important to realize that medicine is not or psychiatry and psychology are not independent spaces. They are very closely woven in, and this will come up at points with other social technologies of domination and social practices to which, again, medicine itself has to justify itself. And that makes it choose many of its prior priorities. It's not a sort of closed space. It is deeply interconnected and interwoven with other spaces. And a lot of the decisions that I'm problematizing here may not be chosen voluntarily. That doesn't mean that, that doesn't make them better. But it, they, it's, it's not that I'm standing here accusing the medical domain. It, it's important to be aware that this is, a lot of this is very contextual and woven in with other interests, be they economic, be they political, be they religious. Okay, so knowledge, and I like that word knowledge, and I like it in particular actually in the plural. I think knowledge is a really good one to use. But knowledge is in the social order of enlightened capitalism become a form of power. Many theorists have been arguing this, I'm not going into detail here, but that means in the psychedelic space that it is aimed at owning knowledge, owning drugs, owning treatment protocols, and we have, of course, a whole apparatus originally not developed for medicine as much as for other industries, but then carried over into the medical domain from patenting and into the natural property licensing regimes. Uh, so there is a way in which actually these medical treatments that have been patented suffer from the way in which the, the way in which intellectual property rights are protected is not particularly suitable to what actually a patient-doctor relationship is. But this is the way we do things now, so we have to take this into account. And of course, science is an intricate, intricate, an intricate part of this, because it are two things that are essential for this knowledge making and power within the sort of system we live in. It classifies and it typifies, and it de-individualizes in this clinical space. And these are the two topics that we're talking about. So first, clinical trials, standardization. Some of you have heard me say some of this before. I apologize if that's so, I do it anyway, <laughs> because I'm finding this so fascinating. So what does a clinical trial actually do? It is there to show that a particular treatment, and I say treatment now, even though originally they were designed for chemicals, drugs, it's actually a problem to, use clinical trials, and that is not only true for psychedelics, that is true for the whole of regenerative medicine. There's a big problem now with the way in which clinical trials are very are impractical to some degree for more complex treatment protocols that require a lot of uh, dif different interactions, not just a chemical given to a person. Um, so, and, and that is true, of course, here, because all the psychedelics <laughs> and protocols involve talking about them. Um, and so you have these human to human interactions that are really critical for the outcome, um, which, however, are very difficult to measure. So, what you try to do is you have an intervention, you want to exactly know whether this particular intervention in a particular type of people achieves the desired outcome. This is what you're trying to prove. In order to prove this, you have to standardize, idealize, ideally, everything about the situation. The patients have to be the same, the setting has to be the same, the couch has to be the same on which people experience their psychedelic trip, et cetera, et cetera. The music, the environment should be the same. So that you can say it's really this amount of psilocybin, of LSD, of MDMA, that in patients with this particular diagnosis has reliably in 80% of the 
then the desired effect. And then two of them you might have, 2% you might have adverse outcome. And the rest is sort of neutral. So okay, let's get this approved. This is the aim. This is the gold standard for all this research in medicine now. It's been contested for a long time uh, because it is problematic for numerous reasons. And as Hansen writes in 2014, opposition against research clinical trials has historically been very strong in psychology and psychiatry because it's very aware of the human dimension of interaction. Um, but these criteria of repeatability and generalizability now hold sway even in this field. So we are trying to square a circle. We are trying to standardize stuff that obviously can't be standardized, as I just said. The patients should be the same. Huh? <laughs> I mean, what, what does that actually mean? We, that means we give them a particular diagnosis according to a particular way in which we counter diagnoses. We try to avoid having this diagnosis missed. So we try to avoid people having multiple diagnoses at the same time, taking certain drugs that might interfere with it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? Having certain other uh, comorbidities, this kind of stuff. But actually to say that two people with the same disease are the same people is obviously weird. Especially when the stuff we expose them to is not just a chemical, but a music playlist, and then a lot of talking about an experience that they might put into very different contexts. So this way in which we try to square the circle here really is the key point to criticize these two papers. Uh, last, last year and the year before, I've been trying to look at this by people who are involved with clinical trials themselves, and they have really been illustrating what the problems are. They've done a quite detailed analysis of the problem, for example, in looking at serious adverse events, but I don't want to go into this now. It would take a bit of time to explain. Um, but so they really wanted to show, next slide please, that actually they wanted to write a manifesto for embracing the weirdness of psychedelics and square this with actually still doing clinical trial research with psychedelics by making better trials. But one shouldn't steer away in clinical medicine, they clearly argue, on the other hand, from the unscientific that lies within the psychedelic. The unique individual experience, the ways in which we actually can't predict what the response of the organism, because it's not just the organism, it's the person, will lead to the intervention, etc. They highlight the re reality and the importance of the psychedelic experience itself. There have recently been proposals to take the experience out of the psychedelic treatment catalog, as you may, may know. I remember uh, Yuki Hendry mentioned that as well in his talk, that people were thinking of developing psychedelics that create the same kind of phenomena when you do the brain scans without people actually having a trip experience. I haven't, I haven't found many psychologists who think it's, it's any viable at all. So if it's, however, the person's experience, then we need to think about how we can do this. So how can we quantify and qualify what they then call the mystical experience? And how to set and setting cultural context and expectations, but also the state, uh, the person-person interaction within any concrete setting affect the outcome. So this is the systematic review of adverse events. I thought I could leave that slide. I have not. You, you can look at this on the recording. I don't want to go through it. But mainly they point out all the problems that they have identified as being real weaknesses in the material that is currently available from existing clinical trials to even be serious about, about reporting serious adverse events uh, or even identifying what counts as such. That's not only a problem in psychiatry. Uh, psychedelic trials either, but it's like, mm -hmm. um, it's just one, uh, one attempt at showing we could make trials better or, and what we would need to make them better, at least concerning this one criterion. Yeah? But in the end, we come back to what I said before, where there are so many epistemological problems, um, such as the cause and effect relationship is very tenuous. Right? Um, then that most patients in reality actually have multiple diagnoses, 
their personalities, relationships to the therapeutic response, etc., are different. There is no guarantee ever of individual effectiveness anyway, and how to measure that. One needs the psychological support, and then psychological support would maybe ideally be given by somebody with whom that person who has a mental health problem already has psychological support from, rather than actually having a psychedelic environment in which you do this kind of treatment, but then you have the therapist you're working with at home. We know, however, that psychedelic therapists have been uh, in court and that that is uh, not the way things have been going. It might, however, still be something to keep in mind. Um, that established therapeutic relationships might be a much better environment for using psychedelics than the currently proposed ones. And then, of course, the importance of the trip experience. Right? Yes. Are better trials desirable, though? Yes, we could make them better. There are many things people have been pointing out. Oh, they could be scientifically better, more rigorous, or maybe uh, with, with a lot of other factors included. We measure much more different things. We open up some of that space. But is that, well, if we record more and more detail, we define and standardize more and more of the detail, like which couch to use, um, does this actually, from a wider ethical perspective, make this more acceptable? And what level of generalization can we achieve from? And I think actually, I seriously doubt that you could make these clinical trials in the scientific sense much better um, because the cultural embeddedness of meaning making within the clinical setting and the individual meaning making processes will always mean that there is a huge aspect of such an intervention that you can in no way standardize, that is culturally specific, it's individually specific, and etc. So is this even a good way forward? Um, thinking about what we are doing outside of what we need to do to get FDA or otherwise approved. Um, so participants need a diagnosis, that is one issue, uh, one point I take issue with, that of course should psychedelics and that gets us to the point that Zeus made that is really in this clinical setting, only with a diagnosis will people get access to psychedelics. If we say that this is the route to decriminalization and to a wider use and to making them mainstream, I think that's probably a lie. <laughs> if the medical establishment has and the pharmaceutical industries have their hold on something that can only through their gateways be accessed. What on earth makes us think that this will end up on the shelves of foods? Which maybe it should. Um, so there is this need to control everything, which is a form of epistemic violence. And I think that is really true in the case of these medicine questionnaires. Yeah. Well, this whole way in which people's experiences are couched into a particular language, into a particular rhetoric, that sort of comes with often the treatment protocol and the questionnaires you have chosen to make people fill in at the end. Yeah? So there is a way in which having to talk about it with somebody who comes with a whole set of expectations that you're hoping before you even enter, get your first drug dose. Yeah? How do you actually, how is this a free experience? In any way, it is corseted into a diagnosis, into a particular purpose, and then you are already being told, and the questionnaire is telling you even more so, how to read your own experience. So, free psychedelic experience, this is not. Then, the issue of trust I already mentioned, and then, of course, there is the risk of hype. For people who are really vulnerable, the risk that they see this as a or the solution to their mental health crisis is actually dangerous, not only because it might disappoint, but because they might seek very unsafe settings mm -hmm. if they can't get access through the currently very restricted channels. But we have a huge public debate. And I mean, in the new Ketamine trial, this is one of the facts that we actually would like to know about, whether between five years ago and now we have a huge difference in the way in which um, people see their own experience, what they expect from being part of this trial, because they've been reading up on it. It's over the news, and five years ago it wasn't. And that could very much affect the outcome of the trial, the whole way in which people come into this, how they, the attitude they take towards it, even though we have 
it's no means broken measuring uh, in comparison, but it will there will be something that we, from what people say we can actually. So the ambiguity of diagnosis, I said that is one of my key points. Uh, diagnosis can be very liberating. People who suffer, say, from a friend of mine has Parkinson's, had that diagnosed when she was about 60. And that was really a relief um, because she was for years falling down the stairs, knocking over stuff, not knowing what was wrong with her, having a foggy mind, thinking she was losing it, you know, and then not much, some of this has changed with medication, but to actually know what you've got. And there's actually a whole history and treatment protocols and stuff that can be done. And also what the scope of this is, you know, is can be really important. So I'm not saying diagnosis is a bad thing, but there is another aspect to diagnosis and that is simply classifying people into boxes. That's what the DSM does. It's sort of making all these treatment resistant depressions one thing. Yeah? And all the people with Parkinson's, yes, they're then the differential diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera. But there is still an approach in which when we say people with a particular diagnosis are allowed to take part in this trial, uh, we have a very clear sense of what this means and what these people have to be like in order to be admitted. It's a practice of subjugation because once you have got the diagnosis, and my friend with Parkinson, she was fairly willing to actually find the treatment at my airport, but on the other hand, it is also a subject, a subject position of being sort of told what to do. There is now a body of authority, of experts, of medical records, of history of knowledge to, that will actually tell or other people tell you what you need to do to get as good as you can be under the circumstances. So we don't get treatment without diagnosis, but as soon as you are in the diagnosis, you are diagnosed you are in the position of receiving that knowledge that others have about how you best go about this now. And so this is a structure of power in which individuals are involved. We have the wider economic issues that come into this medicine. I don't want to talk about this much now because I actually decided to mention them. So let's just go to the next slide. <laughs> but given all this, maybe we need to take a step back. What are we actually doing when we think about psychedelics and, and therapeutic uses of psychedelics in what currently the scientific environment expects one to deliver? Um, are we caught in an ideological bubble of groupthink? Yeah. The original word for groupthink was thought collective, meant slow. A term introduced by this chap, uh, Ludwig Fleck. I think is the founder of science and technology studies. <laughs> a very old book, though, uh, from uh, 1935. And it is, um, he introduces this as being a medic himself, looking at some medical his history of medical diagnosis and how long it sometimes took to actually overcome ideas that were established in a, in a sort of senior committee uh, to break through and feminist Philosophy of science has shown us many cases. We know very well and that there is a way in which thought collectives dominate the scientific field. And whether you look at Kuhn or at Foucault, there are others who have made similar ideas, but there is this resistance to change the frame. Huh? And it seems to me I've presented quite a lot of evidence. Why for thinking about how psychedelics might in our society be a helpful thing to have if we learn how to manage it. Medicine might not be the right way. So back to my original graphic, I know we'll get to the second bit of the utilization of the experience, the ways in which in these clinical settings, this, and I think that is true for the sterility of these settings for numerous reasons that I will show, there is a utilization of these experiences that actually makes them really something that is an imposition on individuals rather than something that has anything to do with cognitive freedom or self-determination. Next slide. Um, so this is a 
colonizing an experience? How do you actually say an experience is colonized? Can an experience I have be colonized? Um, so psychedelic experiences are intense. And many people seem to report change attitudes to their self, to their life, to nature, and to spirit reality. Do such experiences connect to indigenous worldviews? Is there something that we have sort of are increasingly carrying over uh, from sort of the Maria Sabina Gordon Watson situation through to the ways in which treatment protocols are developed, where we actually need to think about individual context dependency of where a person is. Then there's the aspect of self-transcendence and the question of being one with nature. I will come to that. And then I won't talk about it much because I've published on this in this chapter. I've quoted at the top of this here, this whole paradoxy of making the crazy or the mad part of a treatment protocol against madness. And then this way in which it is almost ironical that psychiatrists now experts on this decision. It's really sort of when you think about it, that from, I mean, of course, psychology has always taken over stuff that previously was in the realm, indeed, of the church, you know, where people go to make confessions, but they talk about their moral conflicts, where they do talk about the stuff that they can't sort out in their lives and get guidance. And yes, psychology had, throughout its history, sort of an element of taking some of this into a very different space, that of science and a different kind of relationship, a secular space. But we are now seeing, are we now seeing a reversal of this? Or are, is psychology just taking over a whole other chunk of what we classically think really lies in a different realm, both within the academy as well as in society? So looking at what scientists are writing, mm -hmm. um, and this can be back to my power thing when I say this is actually a form of alienation rather than a form of self-discovery. So, um, in this particular protocol, I have more of this, but I put only this for you. They say psilocybin was administered. That's how a clinical trial protocol describes itself in opaque relative capsule with approximately 100 milliliters of water, both facilitated for presentative present in the room and available to respond to the participants' physical and emotional needs during the day long session, with the exception of short breaks taken by one facilitator at a time. So they needed a week and food. During the session, participants were instructed to lie on a couch in a living room-like environment, and facilitators encouraged participants to focus their attention inward and stay with any experience that arose. To enhance inward reflection, music was played, playlists provided, yeah, and participants were instructed to wear eye shades and headphones. Thanks. Yeah. So this thing about the playlist. <laughs> The, the idea that you would actually give a person a psychedelic on their diagnosis to help them out, and then, however, you would have a very clear idea of choreographing or directing their trip experience. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So this is part of the playlist, and it shows you really nicely how they imagine a trip would go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it starts and it's so brief <laughs> with all this lame classical music. <laughs> Then the psilocybin begins to take effect, and we go to Edward <laughs> and Brahms. Yeah, Felix in the light dragon got on us. I mean, who makes these choices? This, most of this religious music or Christian music, or I mean, why? <laughs> then we have a period that you know. Then we get to the peak, and it's Mozart. Yeah? <laughs> and then we have another Largo Tranquillissimo. Then we have some Strauss post play okay. moderato and tranquil. Yeah. And it says underneath death and transfiguration. So then he's got a question. So one of their earlier plays <laughs> included um Miles Springer of War or something like that. Absolutely. Uh, that's a really good one. Well the, these lists are, there are quite a lot of them and yes. they're very they're different. But there's no 1960s, 1970s music in it. Mm -hmm. There's basically hardly any indigenous or other world world music in it. There's no contemporary music in this. And this must be for the middle class American people who have not grown up <laughs> with European classical music, because I actually know this music. To me, this is not some neutral input to put in my head. I've, Seen this play live, where is the bit? Some of it I could once play on the piano. So, so this is for me not a playlist 
with which anybody could not guide what goes on in me when I hear this might be all sorts of things, but maybe not that. Uh, so th this is quite strange. But next slide. Yeah. And Sabina dropped out and needs to be readmitted. Oh. Um, so then what they say about this playlist is also interesting. We developed a, a sort of intuitive list of favorites that just seemed to work well with a lot of people. People's experiences were going deeper and deeper, becoming very profound. What's that in my episode? And the music in each section is deliberately chosen to accompany a particular part of the psychedelic journey. For example, Richard finds that Samuel Barber's iconic adagio for strings works well if participants approach the peak when the effect of the psilocybin are steadily intensifying. The music chromatically develops as it goes up and reaches this exquisite climax and then comes back down. Thanks very much. For the onset of the drugs, best music is unfolding and has a dependable structure. So that's what they want, yeah? An unfolding dependable structure. And key is a net of reassurance, almost, almost, and of leadership. So almost reassured, but definitely leadership. Yeah? The music helps keep participants from prematurely returning to normal conscious awareness. And the majority of the music is either instrumental or choral with non-English text, and purposefully so. German then. It's <laughs> difficult <laughs> <laughs> to keep participants inside the experience. Only the last section of the playlist uses the lectures with recognizable words when they're supposed to come back. Okay. So it's English recognizable words, I guess. Um, if you're true, if you're truly trying to shift consciousness beyond the level of the everyday self. You have to go beyond language. So this is what the role of the music here is. It's, I mean, it's very clear. The idea that there's anything self-determined in this trip experience, or as I said earlier, that the same people would respond the same to whatever you give them, are both, I think, absurd when you look at the detail in which this is presented. So there is, however, this evidence for a central role of music in psychedelic therapy. Doesn't surprise us after that. Um, and so there is this whole choreography of pre-onset, onset, building towards the peak, peak re-entry and return. And then in this group of Caleb tried to actually measure that and they analyzed the music and how people would respond by asking people how they felt about the music they had been hearing. So they did a project, the Hidden Therapies, Evidence for Central Role of Music in Psychedelic Therapy, and they asked people about whether they liked it. Lick and scale, so you get like it very much, like it a little, like it not at all, you know. Uh, resonance and harmoniousness and openness were the criteria, the grand criteria they were asked about, okay? Excellent. So the results. Analysis of the interviews revealed that the music had both welcome and unwelcome influence on in the interviews as well <laughs> on patients' subjective experience. Conversely, unwelcome influences included the invocation of unpleasant emotion and imagery, a sense of being misguided and resistant. Correlation analysis showed that patients' experience of the music was associated with the occurrence of mystic experiences and insightfulness. Crucially, the nature of the music experience was significantly predictive of reductions in depression one week after psilocybin, where the general drug intensity was not. That's interesting. So the music is maybe as important <laughs> as the drug dose. <laughs> so what, when, we now, when I now say that this music is, however, a way in which really, really are pe people are made to experience particular, at least intensities of emotions, affect, and states of mind, then this fact that the music plays such a key role uh, is, is puzzling. The study indicates that music plays a central therapeutic function in psychedelic therapy. So then there is the dissonance. Of course, that was for me the most interesting thing. What did they find out about dis dissonances? The most prominent cluster, including five out of 10 participants, described music to intensify emotions they did not want to feel such as increased fearfulness, sadness, or fear. In addition, 
five out of ten, again, 50%, made statements, it's very small number, so in these interviews, made statements about the music creating a sense of discomfort, including unpleasant or uncomfortable experiences, and four out of ten described irritation as a consequence of the music. Six out of 19 made statements about misguidance, that they felt the music was actually getting lost and somewhere they didn't be. Um, a mismatch to what they were feeling in their experience. So they had to work to get rid of the music <laughs> whilst they were trying to move on somewhere. And then 30% include descriptions of the music feeling intrusive, being unable to positively influence the challenging situation or experience, and giving a sense of being manipulated. The music giving a sense of unmet potential. So there would have been more in my trip if only you had let me go there and not your music told me when to go up and when to go down. So it's 30% perceived this is actually really interfering seriously with the experience. Remind me, more numbers. Is this a good or a bad thing? Of course, in the grand scheme of things, when you go to the FDA and 70% of people with that diagnosis, this treatment protocol with that particular music playlist works really well, at least say in Kansas, um, then that um, means that could still very well worth pursuing. Yeah? Help, being able to help 70% out of 100 is not a bad thing. On the other hand, <laughs> the music that is being used is so culturally in, sort of imprinted. This carries so much cultural ideas with it. It's so white <laughs> that, that this is really, when you think about branching this out and getting universal treatments, we are nowhere near this. If the music is so important, we need a very different design of thinking about how, in the case of people with mental health issues, psychedelic drugs could help them. None of this can easily be scaled up. Go with this music playlist in other parts of the world. This is obviously strange. And so the solution then, of course, is that we need a significant body of empirical work to test out how this might work, how we can actually predictively measure so science, if you find something doesn't work in science, you always propose more science, more rigid science, just like I said, Brexham and, and Houston have been doing. This is, is the same here, yeah. We need more rigid, rigid, predictive understanding of how certain kinds of people respond to certain kinds of music. Then we could get it right. <laughs> so if psychiatry is a part of the medicine and pharmaceutical industrial complex, where profit is a major motive, as some of my colleagues, I've, I've just put in here together some arguments of colleagues of mine. So given my example about the music now and why I think power in the clinical trial experience or in the clinical therapeutic experience of psychedelics is a really an important factor, maybe not just power, maybe manipulation. Yeah? Uh, it's something we may really need to keep in mind and be very aware of. Um, so colleagues have been looking at this and thinking about the ways in which we can consider indigenous knowledges in which we can actually think about how we get out of this profit motive or how this is problematic in this field. And then the question of how can we, do we need to, and is it inevitable and it seems at this point to be that these experiences individuals have in these settings are so reined in to fit an epistemic setting and a profit mechanisms of medicine that actually other things fall by the wayside. So what does it mean? And I talk about ethics and power. Um, so now, of course, this is Freud. I had some slides at the beginning of my talk about critical theory and some key concepts, et cetera, but I've taken it out <laughs> um, because I felt we can maybe, if you want to talk about this, we can. But it is really important that here, what we have is the patients are becoming somewhat passive exemplars. They exemplify their diagnosis and the type of person you want in your trial. And then they are recipients of whatever that protocol is. And in that sense, the sort of, in order to create mass market psychedelic psychotherapy, there is at this point no other way to do with the regulatory, the legal, and the other, and the scientific criteria that are in place. 
this is how it has to be. But as is, as an ethicist and a critical theorist, the idea of people, well, for that matter, animals and plants becoming just passive exemplars are quite problematic. I do not use this lightly. I think this is the, the real problem here. Then there is, of course, the commodification of substances that becomes fetishes. So where the question is really, is it the psilocybin that does this to your brain scan? Um, or is it another drug in which dose that does this then to how the brain looks under this, that or the other scanning tool? Um, but as I tried to show, the music seems to be very important. We also know the therapeutic relationship and the integration process are very important. So, so this is not a drug protocol we are thinking of developing. And if that is not the case, then we need to think about the role of the substances and what else these substances could be other than within this very caged environment. And then, of course, in medicine, the value lies not in different worldviews, in becoming wiser or in learning anything. <laughs> it just lies in overcoming your drug addiction, feeling being less depressed, or whatever the definition was at the outset. So if there are any other of the uses that Osiris pointed out to us, they are not to be found in there. We need to be very aware of this. So what does the ethics of care then mean if we think about it differently? No playlists, no eye shades, no enforced passivity. That is not how a clinical trial can easily be run. There are some people trying this, at least with groups of people, maybe in the outdoors, but this is very difficult. How, how would you possibly define this so that you can get it into a treatment protocol? And this is, this is part of the problem. If it was just about finding out how actually within people with mental health problems could possibly benefit from being given psychedelics, we could experiment freely if the drugs were illegal. And uh, if we didn't have to prove to regulators that this is a profitable treatment that gets an FDA or MHRC or whatever approval and then can go through the healthcare system and be rolled out, et cetera. This whole apparatus of evidence production has nothing to do with the question of whether people with mental health could benefit from psychedelics. This is the way in which, however, medicine and psychology and psychiatry here are infused with other criteria on top of that very question of how can we actually maybe use this to make people who are like that feel significantly better? Because then we don't need to prove that this is the case for all people in the world with this particular diagnosis or for all white bodies who like classical music within this world or something like this. We, we could just try it out wherever we are and check it a bit more here, a bit more there. You could develop a sort of Cleverness, maybe some wise woman or wise man the ability to read a room in a set in the setting, but instead what we get is this need to produce rich protocol, and that is where I think it fails. So all of this has to go out. We need a different way of working on this. So this is a nice quote I found getting us back to the, the colonizing. According to Gabriel Sayer, the shaman ascends to higher realms where he listens to, the listens to the melodies from the spirits and sings with them. These songs have a visual manifestation that the women transmit in their art. The Shipibo believe their bodies are covered by invisible designs. Illness is the disruption of the patterns, and the songs of the shaman restore their order and beauty. Healing is thus an aesthetic endeavor. The Shipibo should people believe their bodies are covered? I don't have to sit twice. I'm throwing that in. So, so why do we feel we're in Santa Rosa, a Shipibo settlement at the uh, Ucayali River? I, and that is Luis Eduardo Luna, of course, I asked Don Basilio Gordon, a shaman, about the plants he used to heal his patients. He said that it is enough to know the song of the plants to be able to cure. The plants are needed only if you don't know their song. So you can do the singing once you got to the point that you knew the songs of the plants that you would need to hear that person. So we are sort of very, very much going crutches here. So coming back to the question of self-determination and liberty, can autochthonous healing of individuals in a community happen? 
if no one knows the actual song of the plants, if what we put in place instead is what I've been describing throughout this talk. So for different connections to the world outside us, a different choreography and sensory guidance might be necessary. If genuine new appreciation, appreciation for nature, and this gets me to this nature connected state, is a desired outcome, then sensory encounters with the outside seem to be necessary, frankly. You can't lock people up in a room like them on a couch with eye shades and headphones. Okay? This is not how you can encounter nature. Um, so this is a, what I call an alienation. It's a manipulation of the self in which the outside is made irrelevant. So the attention in the clinical trial, and I've quoted you from them to say that, is guided towards visualizations that are being produced from within the mind of, that the patient brings to that space. Yeah. There is no physical sensory encounters, touching or smelling anything differently than they would in their everyday life. They come in this and they go out in nature environment and in subjective environments that are experiences just as they came in. Because you, you have no actual engagement with anything that smells or tastes or looks beautiful. Think of Huxley's famous thing with the rose or, you know, but there has to be a rose. <laughs> there is no rose in the setting we seem to want it to provide. So the connectedness that then arises to nature and to the globe and to the cosmos is an imaginary connectedness. It is not on the ground of any actual experience physically for the whole experience that the person has other than what they've already pre-configured. And here it is really important that the narrations and the psychedelic imagery, as Luis Eduardo told us, when his way in which he now critically reflects on the work he did with Pablo Amarinko and getting actually producing all this indigenous imagery, which of which there's now so much kitsch, some of which we could admire at breaking convention. Um, but actually this is the imagery people have in their minds of what they might see. Yeah? And so this is what comes up, but how does this connect to our everyday life, to the actual environment we live in? So I think this inner, the emphasis on inner mental processes is really a problem and it is reductive. It takes away from the ethical importance that maybe such experiences could have for people to change their lives and their attitudes to the world and the others they live in because it's so silent. So the concerns with an ethics of decolonization then in this are moral culpability and compensation for past exploitations to indigenous people and other marginalized groups, and to think about inequalities and how we can prevent them from continuing. And it seems what we create in this clinical space is very much a continuum that just eclectically picks up stuff that it can fit in some way, in some distorted format, through the ring of what we call science, you know, this mangle, into these protocols, um, not only not giving recognition, but actually probably having it distorted to a point of pointlessness. Um, so the inequalities that exist continue, and we do nothing to uh, prevent them. So there are new practices of colonization happening in the space, and we need to look at them. Um, one aim we wrote in our article um, that we wrote together in the colonial group is, of the colonial ethics is to avoid unknowingly reifying indigenous colonial logics in efforts to overcome that very power in the study of psychedelic practices, such as in places like Mexico or the Amazon. There is, however, also a structure of power within this medical setting, just within our own societies, where we are also colonizing the minds of people who come with maybe severely disturbed mental health and who are in trouble, yeah? And what we offer them is something that is quite an imposition, one might say. And at least some people seem to clearly experience it like that. A decolonial ethics would be capable of creating new forms of relationality grounded in a different social ontology. And that includes relationality, as I just said, to the trees and the plants and the people you are in a room with or maybe outdoors to create other forms of experience, expanded consciousness rather than that. So I've been speaking about from this graph some of you have seen before, I didn't speak much about the other thing, just the yellow stuff. Um, but of course, the synthetic reproduction 
that we are trying to do with we synthesize or we the standardization of the psychedelic treatment protocol is a process of synthesizing not only the drugs but also the experiences themselves of making them into a commodity that then we can dish out on prescription for us. Yeah? And this is exactly the opposite of this idea of a widening, a wider consciousness or new ex novel experiences of oneself in the world that we supposedly are aiming. So that's, I think, my last, last slide. So we need a ethics that thinks through these processes with the aim to, uh, of course, for indigenous cultures and knowledge practices, for people, plants, and animals, but also for societies that harm, are harmed by unaddressed colonizations, for individuals who suffer from mental ill health and those who don't, uh, protecting the ineffable, that space that is not necessarily to become part of big databases in which everybody who's part of a trial reports exactly about their experience in the very format in which they are taught to and in which we can then draw on these tens of thousands of trip reports to find out what. <laughs> we only find out what we've put in as clusters. There is nothing to be found out. Some things might be left out of that clinical space and they might much better slide there. Then in for liberty and uh, repairing these disordered relationships that I've mentioned and for communities and that is really Thinking about these shifting powers that are enacted were the psych psych psychological treatments with psychedelics are really part of this big medical pharmacal industrial complex that aims to manipulate and control and of course to profit from this as much as possible. If psychedelics are something alternate of an alternate reality we could access, the chances that that is the way to go there to me seem silch. <laughs> So, I think that is it. Yeah. Okay, so we're, I'm here for questions, but we are both here for questions. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Very interesting. I wanted to uh, ask you a question about nausea. Yeah. Um, because I was thinking, first of all, when, when I was talking about how they don't actually do experiments on, you know, the sort of psilocybin or the mushrooms, or they extract what they see as the active ingredient, mm -hmm. which then raised the question for me, well, first of all, do people get nauseous in these clinical trials? And how would they deal with that? But also in relationship to the kind of indigenous models, and again, I don't want to, you know, sort of homogenize that, but a lot of these substances, whether it's psilocybin or morning glory seeds or yagi or whatever, like it makes you incredibly nauseous, right? And a lot of times as a result of that, sort of the indigenous practices have to actually sort of, you know, incorporate that into the healing. It's sort of, you know, yeah. horrific vomiting is oftentimes actually part of the, the whole point of the, the process of, of being cured, right? So have they sort of somehow managed to get that out of these experiences or, or do they still have to manage that somehow or and if so how do they deal with that there are no trials to my knowledge with ayahuasca or yaki and of course uh, as you said nobody does trials with psilocybin either is there one now well that's the ones in Brazil that I was yeah. yeah the people talk about in Sao Paulo yeah um you was involved with nothing He's, you know, he's not so bothered by a bit of vomit. What's the problem? It's <laughs> <laughs> like, well, you know, why go to all that trouble to sort of get rid of what a lot of people who use these substances is actually an important part of the whole experience. Mm. Well, you can see it as a in the, in the old medicine model, as a sort of purification, yeah, getting rid of the stuff that you have surplus. Or, but I mean, if you're lying on a couch. With eyelids and headphones on, I'm not sure how much nausea is a problem. Is it? We have not had nausea. <laughs> Somebody put up. Yeah, we definitely didn't frame it as a purging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's a really good point. <laughs>
Where we were now. <laughs> as far as I know, psilocybin trials, they have very little nausea happen with it. And certainly from my experiential knowledge of seeing people using psilocybin mushrooms, it's very rare to people to feel nausea or yeah. So while they may do on ayahuasca and some of the other substances, psilocybin mushrooms don't make you feel sick. They might make you feel a bit odd, but you very rarely mm -hmm. feel sick. And it's the same with the trials. They have like a little container in case people feel nausea, but very few people do and they need to feel ill rather than actually be ill or getting well in my was the brain. Mm -hmm. Can you colonize people with decolonization? I think you can. There's actually a quite a lively debate about this. That this whole decolonized speech has taken over and we are colonizing the world with decolonization. <laughs> that, that is, is an interesting discussion. Um, and it depends very much on how you frame it. Huh? Yeah. If, if the aim of. So, when I, I've, I've used this term colonization very widely for all ways in which things are made to be. Um, appropriated by others or gained other than themselves yeah? or their own well-being. Um, so Habermas spoke of the colonization of the life world. And with that, he meant the way in which institutions of governance and law take over and actually undermine the opportunity for equal uh, democratic discourse. Yeah? So colonization in this very metaphorical use is something where decolonization is a way of speaking against particular forms of domination and power that are extractivist. And we, of course, see these everywhere. I mean, Facebook is a fantastic tool of colonization of everybody's life world. It, it appears to be similar to what you were talking about. So it's with the whole like freedom for power, uh, the, that power level. Yeah, that's important at all. But if you don't speak about the power relations or the structures of domination that happen in the physical space, then you just pretend this is all easy. And I think there are a lot of problems within it that I wanted to point out. But it seemed to me that you were positive that certain ontologies were superior to others, rather than saying, like, oh, let's make space for all of them, let's make space for the synthetic psychedelics and the clinical space. Um, you would. You seem to me correctly if I'm wrong that you were saying no, we need to be in nature, we need to be using the plant medicines over these forms. And isn't that some actually I, um, see that I can see how this may have reflected like that. Um, but I think that there is an interesting way in which the proper Western use of psychedelics might just be to take LSD. <laughs> because that that's the kind of stuff we do, yeah. That's what pharmaceutical companies develop. It's easy, it's cheap. You can so yeah. it, so it, it's actually in yeah. some way that would be more straightforward yeah. to use the synthetic lab made why, chemicals that change people's minds. Why not yeah. why not use all of them? All the two C analogs, all the different psilocybin analogs. Why not draw up on the full range? Because they come really range with range. a different epistemology, a different way of knowing. They they elicit also other imageries. Yeah. Okay. We, I mean, the, the, yeah, we don't have a good phenomenology, and I'm not a great believer in linking the brilliant phenomenology right. and what different people experience on different drugs, because I think this is actually so dependent, for example, on the order in which they started to experience these drugs. It's never just the drug. <laughs> why, why place the emphasis on ones that are used by these indigenous cultures rather than the plurality? plurality I can't say that word. The plurality of all the different potential species. Because indigenous peoples were the guardians of this knowledge for several centuries, right? Uh, if we are talking about therapeutic, you know, use of psychedelics, it's because the indigenous elders, you know, kept the knowledge in a clandestine way, you know, uh, in, in spite of the fact of colonialism, right? For, for example, the, the historical sources regarding psilocybin mushrooms shows that the archaeological evidence, the codices and manuscripts from, from 16th century, the, the ritual, the, the therapeutic, and even the hedonistic uses of psychedelics. But, for example, in the colonial archives, it is possible only to find four trials on psilocybin mushrooms. On the other hand, you find a lot of trials of peyote, right? 
and these nodes were hidden for four centuries, five centuries, you know, mainly by women, right? And we have to recognize this this effort. Of course, I agree with with, with Christine in, in the in the fact that from a Western perspective, LSD or synthetic mescaline will be a very useful tools. Why are not using why the psychedelic renaissance is not using LSD because the stigma, right? Because we are trying to overcome yeah. the counterculture of the six. The, the time of it takes so long, it's too expensive to have a therapist for that many hours. That's why we have five in the audience because of the yeah. I yeah. mean, this is, this, yeah. is such, this is such a choice of treatment pathway development with an eye to all the process through to regulation, through to health insurance reimbursement, and what the protection costs might be. That actually determines yeah. the research we are doing. And this is what I'm trying to point out is so problematic. Even now, for example, the, the goal is to reduce the time, you know, to spend less money, you know, the facilitators, therapists, and, and, and so on. Yeah. Sorry, just finish following on what Ronnie said. So, so can you see the synthetic psychedelics as, uh, as less than their natural counterpart? What do you think that's the wrong way to frame the question? Well, no, no, no. I guess that the, that the separation between natural and synthetic, it's also controversial, right? Both has different contradiction and, and paradoxes. But for example, in the case of peyote, Peyote is an endangered mm -hmm. species. For example, it's ethic, for example, to over harvesting peyote to satisfy a spiritual need. Why don't use, for example, for other for other people, psychedelic tourists and so on, and synthetic mescaline, right? And before they criminalize, you know, any plant, encourage the preservation of the plant. You know, there are no programs of you know growing hard, uh, growing uh, peyote and avoid the over harvesting. You know, but of course you have to decriminalize and encourage, for example, the growing of peyote for fifteen years at least. But in our psychedelic renaissance, time is money, right? And, and, and this is the way that it shaped the, the research. Uh, I want to say something on this as well, but I think Anessa wants to make a point first. Yeah, just I just want to say that synthetic stuff is not just about isolating the substance, it makes it patentable, right? So it's, it's not just about these things of making it synthetic or not. And, and that's a different thing. One thing is to say, if we try to extract what is the active ingredient in the or in mushroom, then mm -hmm. that, that's classical colonizing behavior. Yeah. yeah? The other thing is to say, we develop a drug in the laboratory that makes people, many people, have certain kinds of experiences. It's very cheap, like this day, you know, we can mass produce it, and it does something that is, it's, it's not the appropriation necessarily. Of course, if it is modeled only to achieve what you did, but it wasn't actually historically different. LSD is its own thing. It wasn't there to be an alternative to patented psilocybin. It's, it's, so there is a way in which you could argue that it's a pharmaceutically produced drug that fits exactly into the sort of science paradigm we live in. Why don't we work with that? Huh? Because that would avoid some of the colonizing aspects of the way in which currently this field moves forward. I think that is really important to realize that maybe we should just go and say, let's do what this, what this the kind of stuff we do. When you say that they were colonizing the empathetic users and experiences, you know, when you say the MSD on the underground, I mean, not on the underground train. Um, then the mushrooms have, of course, been yeah, yeah. everywhere. It's a big question of people in Europe or in yeah. ancient days did use mushrooms and yeah. had psychedelic experiences with them. So, this question that we have not known about it anymore. After sort of hundreds and thousands of years of Christian purging of it, yeah, that was obscure or magical. Yeah? Uh, it's maybe no surprise. So this question of 
the mushroom is interesting in that and very different from yahi or ayahuasca because it is something that grows globally and yeah. probably was it used here and there for this and that at some point globally. Yeah. I think they are using cubensi, for example. Their research, for example, it's not carried out on Silosiva celulensis, Silosiva mexicana, Silosiva stecorum, Silosiva masatecorum, and so on and so on. But the reason they are using cubensis due to safety reasons, but also, for example, have you ever seen the prices of the Oregon uh, treatment with psilocybin? $3,500 for two grams of psilocybin. <laughs> you are not paying for the substance. You are paying for the therapies, the facilities, and so on. Which is the result of this? They are encouraging the psychedelic stories in Mexico with three thousand five hundred dollars. You can live six months and have all the psychedelic experience that you want. You know, three thousand five hundred dollars for a session of six hours. Hi, uh, first of all, that was really, really interesting. Thank you. And just to say, like you mentioned, that the randomized control trials are the golden standard of kind of like medical evidence. But I think this is slowly changing towards kind of like using more real world data. Would this be more from an ethical viewpoint, more acceptable because people can do psychedelics on their own home the way they like with the music they like, and then they could go somewhere and then there's some sort of like, I don't know. Experience either kind of like hard, kind of like quantitative stuff, or even qualitative, just describe their experience. And someone could analyze this later. And with a lot of data, you could get some interesting insights, perhaps, from what works and what doesn't. And so, the second part is just to drive away from the medicalization of this whole thing. Would it perhaps help to use kind of like some more positive psychology type of kind of like outcomes? So, kind of like more segments, positive traits, instead of just using like depression, anxiety, and stuff like that. Because what we carry is whether these things make our lives better, rather than whether depression or anxiety, whether this might be skewed. I am not sure whether the drug alone would make the life better. But of course, all experiences we have in our life have an impact on our life. Some make it seriously worse, only for half a year or a year. Death, illness, things happen in people's lives. We have experiences all the time, and they affect how we are in the world now, some for longer, some for less long, some change you for the rest of your life. And psychedelic experiences for some people seem to be among the experiences that change them, that they perceive as so meaningful that they actually say that has seriously changed me. Um, the other people don't, yeah? You can probably go to, I don't know how many raves coming out, exactly the same person throwing their litter in the park as you were before. And that is not the question in which, or not, you know, it, not, not all people are the same. So, so I think it's important that what, what I'm really trying to argue is, uh, and I hope this became apparent, is that this idea that through medicalization we can work against the stigmas and the laws that restrict, if not prohibit, radical access to psychedelic experiences, that this is the way to go. I think the opposite is the case. I think there's probably a way not to go. <laughs> I think we probably should simply criminalize the substances as they are not addictive. And there are so many things in our societies that do people harm. I'm not sure why we get so hung up on this things. Um, so, and then try to educate people what this stuff is. But the the ways in which, and, and that would allow them all sorts of real field experiments, and then everybody could do their own field experiment, as we are with so many other things, whether we drink alcohol or smoke, whether we do this or that, which music we are, we experiment with ourselves. That's what we do, and with the social environment we are in. But the scientific rigidity of the protocol the need to have the diagnosis, which means including more vulnerable people in the first place, and then have measurable outcomes that then have to be priced before you even start because it has to be going through the NHS. This is just such a ballast that it's more an obstacle than a tool for liberation. Also, also a brief remark, for example, it's very important to highlight that the psychedelics are not magic bullets. 
right? And we have to take into account some social issues or social factors. For example, quite the people is depressed. I was talking in Denver in, in psychedelic conference with a, with a person of the University of Wisconsin-Madison who had a, a master program in, in pharmacology and, and so on and so on. And, and he answered me, oh, well, yes, you're right, but uh, we were not solving the world of people. And, and, I, and, and I answered him, well, at least you have to take into account this social ontology, this social issue, the social issues, and ask why people is depressed. Perhaps you are not able to solve, you know, the, the life of the people, you know, but at least, for example, uh, in order to achieve more efficacy, try to include a social worker in, in, in the clinical trials. And, 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 and he answered, oh, I never been thinking in that. Oh, yes, we will include a, a, a social worker. Why the people is depressed, right? Because poverty, lack of opportunities, uh, trauma, and, and, and so on. Even if you are on the mind trip to achieve more efficacy, you need to take into account, you know, the, the, the social factor in order to explain why the people is depressed. You know, the 10% of the worldwide population will, will be face resistant depression. Why? You know, and only and if we only consider that the psychedelic, the isolated substance will be the cure for everything, this is a naive perspective also. We have to take into account, you know, the whole thing. I mean, that was one of the things that really upset me at ICPR. Mm -hmm. When the, this question when asking why the post-traumatic stress in the patients that they treat, uh, and you, this question, so what are these patients? And you look at the protocols, and a huge percentage of these is women suffering from sexual abuse and sexual violence. Yeah. And I mean, this was a long standing argument, 50 years old against psychiatry, that it's actually from, from the anti psychiatrists, that it's actually always only coming to interfere with the few people who have, many people have terrible experiences, a few who absolutely, even two years after, can't cope. They then get a diagnosis and then they get treated. Yeah? But maybe we should need to look at A, what is with these other 80%? who have not get treatment, but also were blocked in their life and maybe have long-term impact that just doesn't qualify for diagnosis or is differently described in their own mind to them as what their experience was. Maybe we should start thinking about preventing some of the experiences people seem to have that might be worth, at least as worth investing money in than always thinking about how those who absolutely can't cope after a number of years, we can get them out of the deepest depth of their tongue so that they are functioning again. Just that functioning, that's what we are asking for. Mm -hmm. Not happiness, not a fulfilled life. We just want them to no longer be addicted to drink, to no longer be unable to leave their house because they can't face anybody. Yeah? So, so the, we, the expectations are so small. It's, it really is important to start thinking about the wider whole, which is why this way in which if alienation has something to do with the way people are mentally ill, then using something that in, a, in the process itself alienates them again seems to not be a very good way to deal with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. My question may not be for the authors um, on cognitive liberty and the age section way to go. Because I get any experience there. So if psychedelics are like as pharmacology for uh, mental health, so um, it can be water treatment and poison, um, that is also apply to processes of uh, cognitive liberty in the sense that the increases of ability and the belief changes that we see um, can go in directions where people become more orientated and actually they're being controlled by an external source. And what is the key there? How should we be talking about ACC in your view? Well, it's a, a complete liberty related also with agency, right? And for example, if the psychedelic experience is capable to uh, encourage and uh, reinforce the agency, it's okay, right? Uh, in, in, in different ways, individual and collective because uh, it's not only an, an individual issue, you're right. It is not only an ego or egoist uh, topic. In, in, in that sense, for example, if your 
um, individual uh, uh, freedom, it's compatible with collective freedom, that's okay, for example. But if the recognition of your freedom implies, for example, the denial of the freedom of other, you know, this cognitive freedom, it's an illusion, for example, as, as Christine said, for example, many patients in clinical trials are women suffering violence, right? And I'm thinking more in terms of people that end up joining a cult or being controlled, so they lose their cognitive liberty in that aspect. Well, um, it's, it's, it's uh, controversial because with the use of psychedelics, you are at the borders. And at the same time, for example, psychedelics are um, or have a, a transformative capacity, but of course, only a person on the, under the influence of psychedelics, it's very influential, right? And it, this is not, um, this is very, this is not a common topic, you know? And, and for example, as, as psychedelics could be seen as a tool of liberation, right? Psychedelics could be used as a tool of manipulation, right? And with the standardization of, of clinical trials and the opening of the market, for example, it is possible to achieve the colonization of the imagination, you know, with all these standards and, and protocols and, and so on. For example, in Mexico, I used to, uh, to give some courses for, for education, and I have hundreds of people in the, in the WhatsApp group asking for this. And this is the standardization, the autodiagnosis. A uh, professor, teacher, and, 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 and please recommend me a people who it's working with. In Mexico, it's forbidden, right? Recommend me a people, you know, who it's working with the therapeutic purposes. And, and, and the people focus on the therapeutic, the therapeutic purposes with the, with the self-diagnosis, okay? I make the own diagnosis, I need it, and then I will go with the therapist with the mainstream or with the underground, you know, it, 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 it doesn't care. But this is a double-edged sword, right? It, it is a, it's a complex issue, but of course a critical approach will be useful to overcome this uh, internal medicalization, right? Do you, think you don't need it. That leads to the present or that can happen after a psychedelic experience to shift the the liberation rather than manipulation. Well, not only after, you know, we, 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 because we tend to focus on the integration uh, phase. By the reason at the beginning of, of my talk, I highlight the uses, recognize the different uses of, uh, of psychedelics. Of course, if you have a, a therapeutic, a diagnosis and a therapeutic goal, it, it's it's possible to explore these, these situations, but if you don't, right? If you are using psychedelics for other different reasons, because the politics of prohibition also sti uh, stigmatizes the pleasure. And it's a paradoxical sense that instead to recognize that I want to use psychedelics for pleasure, right? I try to justify for the stigma uh, uh, with an illness. I need the psychedelics because I need treatment, right? It's better to be a little bit more cynic and say it's for the pleasure, right? Instead of say, oh, I, I suffer, I am facing, you know, a, a, a mental illness or a mental condition, then I need psychedelics and I put it on the way. Let's find the clock and we should really clear this. <laughs> Ernesto and then Celia, final word? Yes. <laughs> Um, uh, I, just, I just want to argue with this notion of agency and manipulation and free will. I think that's a wrong approach here. I really like this in approach of framing. Why right? if we start thinking of agency in those very simplistic terms, there's no way out. And then if we think a little bit harder in terms of subjectivity, I would like to go join a cult and they're being controlled. I don't think that's simple, right? I mean, you can say the same about religion, disciplines. So we need to get nuance far more the agency debate here. Yeah. We cannot do anything with that. Because if not, it's going to be a detailed question. But it's about... some agency in deciding to actually oh, see a therapist. Well. This has usually like been the yeah. criteria that you go to therapy because you are at a point in your life where you think this is the best way for you to move forward. So there's sort of the 
I, I don't think there is such a thing as a free mind. We are always guided by things, but we may have yeah, the ability to choose, to choose the sort of regimes within which we operate. And of course, with psychedelics at the moment, you either join, join a religion or you have a diagnosis. These are the only legitimate uses. <laughs> and so this, this sort of is a corset of choices which we are problematizing. We think there needs to be more choice, but we also think there needs to be decriminalization. <laughs> ah, yes, for sure. And, and of course, liberty and freedom are con controversial issues. Perhaps it is better to talk about technologies itself, right? There is not a kind of absolute freedom, right? We, we, we uh, the freedom has borders and we choose inside these borders, right? The, and the affinity being, it's not possible that a finite being achieve an absolute freedom. This is an utopia, right? Not even a desirable one. Yeah. I was just about to point out, and I think you both alluded to that really, because yes, I agree that medicalization was being involved in it, but psychedelics is problematic. But to me, it seems like there was a problem, I think, which you were acknowledging really is the medicalization of the pathologization of kind of human experience, poverty social injustice, the things that we now call mental health, mental health health. So that's the thing we should be challenging really because we don't challenge that structure. And that's obviously culturally specific, isn't it? But I don't think that's the same in addition to cultures, these notions of mental health and ill health in the same way that we have it. It's very well, shame yeah. to accept that, that they don't know yeah. what to might do with these tourists from the West. <laughs> they can't understand their problems. So yeah. is that what the <laughs> should be made in the guests rather than just the medicalization of psychedelics of the border? And it's the framework that gives people like this for the first place. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have enough time, but it's probably, for example, interesting issues to address the cross cultural character of illness. For example, Osiris Garcia Cerqueda, a massive historian in, in one of uh, the symposia organized by Via Synapsis, one organization in Mexico, he states What happens if Maria Sabina knows that the, that the, that the sacred model will be useful to face? Post traumatic stress syndrome. <laughs> or if you go to the to the clinic and say, Oh, I lost my shot. <laughs> no. There are different, no, uh, different sources of the illness. And for example, a cross-cultural uh, psychiatry and a cross-cultural philosophy has to take into account these different mm -hmm. worldviews and these different uh, ontologies. Of course, it's a challenge. We don't have enough time, but it will be an interesting topic to uh, develop and to address. Uh, Later. Mm -hmm. um, David and Lucius, thank you for sticking with us. <laughs> yeah.